that um, it, it's based on really sick, uh, satanic stuff, but strangle, stab, shoot, burn, and then ritualistically lay them out close to a church, close to police, public parks, maybe strange thing, you know, strange things at the scene that don't really make sense. Yeah, he would, and that's what he says in that letter I read to you earlier, is that he leaves clues at all the scenes as to who he is. But you, police didn't think that a killer like that existed. Was he ever connected to any type of um, radical group as maybe clans, skinheads, or? Satanists. Satanists? Yeah, okay. he was a secret society. Um, trying to think of the name of the one in San Francisco that he was kind of tied with, but just Satanists. And you know, I, I know when you say that word, it sounds kind of, you know, yeah. nobody really understands yeah. it, but but there was another man that got caught the same time Edwards got caught in 2010, and his name was Frank Dryman, and he was a Satanist. And I, I got to interview him before Ed Edwards ever even came into my life, and so I kind of understood what he meant by that. And what they do is they portray themselves as the most religious people. Mm -hmm. And yep. then they completely satanically kill and leave clues that tie to Christianity. Leaving them in church parking lots, leaving them crucified with yep. their hands spread out. Their, um, the left side of their face usually fashed in more than anything because the left side's the dark side, the right side's the light side. It would always be just ritualistic. And that's, yeah. that, he talks about that in, the, in his book that he wrote. And uh, you wouldn't really understand it until you actually realized that he's a killer. And, and right. what he meant in that book was he was killing. Did he ever indicate to you that he had someone else or others working with him, or did he, he work alone? He flat told me in a phone interview. That's a lot of people said, well, he had to have people working with him, and he did, but not on the murder. He had people drug into his conspiracies of insurance fraud and and crime and everything, but these people had no idea that the outcome was going to be the death of someone near to them. Well, let me ask you this. Was there any other people that he had, had doing them at that period of time, helping them to work? Did any of them have any clue that he was the killer? You know, that now, once he was discovered, uh -huh. uh, yeah, they all suspected that there was really something wrong with this man. And but nobody but at the beginning. Nobody would go against them either. Because I was in his wives, you know? Nobody. Nobody. If they were more afraid of him than they were the police of anybody else. He, even his children said the same thing. I mean, the kids didn't become suspicious, all this moving from oh, place to yeah. place every other month? Yeah. Or, but they, or his just, wives? Yeah, well, they all did. Yeah, no one them. came forth. Nobody would come forth because was he was scared. alive and he was yeah. out, scared. and they were more afraid. Remember about yeah. the kids sitting on the couch the, the, and couldn't Oh, move. that was yeah. yeah. The description of that was horrible, and that yeah. was just one. That was when they were actually older. The worst time was during the Atlanta child killings. That was probably the he was the the worst from 1970 until his capture in '82, um, and he was just con targeting communities killing children, and and just creating terror. I mean, he, Well, you know, <clears throat> when Wayne was arrested and convicted, <clears throat> there was killing still going on here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And uh, from 25. 81, 82, well, 80, 81 and 82, 82. there was killing going on. But you well, know, they, he they was keep, already arrested. Right, right? and they yeah. tried to, you try to keep this on the hush. Yeah, because you got the rep. They think yeah, they got the yeah, dead. Yeah, right. Yes, and then so, they just say that's somebody else. At the time, they had something like a hundred precincts yeah. that was open here in Atlanta. As soon as they can get the way, they shut all the precincts down like that within a week time. And what what you're saying about Satanists makes a lot of sense to me because on um, part of my research, um, I found a uh, article in which a woman from I think it was Miami, Florida said she was here and she was visiting some man she said some man she didn't say who and she said that the man took her to uh, a, a satanic ritual yeah. that was involving a young black child this you is repeated I mean? stuff that comes out in edwards's whole life that i've yeah. followed he did the same thing in detroit mm -hmm. with children uh toledo ohio where he actually they had he had brought in um, he would target people with uh, psychiatric problems and then drag them into his satanic 
stuff and then mm -hmm. get them to help steer the evidence right. to innocent people. Right. And yeah, it's 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 really horrible. Yeah. You, you know, and, but it's satanic, and I, and then I, I keep repeating that because I didn't. You know, we always heard about Satanists on TV or mm -hmm. or in the movies, and it's really a joke the way they portray them because it's nothing like that. These yeah. men are just evil, pure evil, and don't don't brag about it. So and no conscience. No None. He says that in interviews. I don't know if you've watched the interviews on the mm -hmm. uh, YouTube with him. He'll look right in that camera and say, mm -hmm. it didn't bother me, and I moved on. And his eyes mm -hmm. are just... No wow. soul. Because this guy went on and, and, and went on shows, TV shows, and, okay. and talked about... Right? He told the whole world in 1972 that he was a suspect in a double murder. And here he is, the Zodiac Killer, who was killing double people on Lover's Lane, standing on TV to tell the truth, saying that he's a suspect in a double murder, he impersonates police officers, and he was a doctor of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. That was so yeah. odd. And they didn't take it seriously. So no, yeah. well, you know, Alan Alda, if it, you look at that thing, thing, Alan Alda kind of looks at him yeah. like something yeah. isn't right here. And that would fly right. today. Yeah. My name is Ed Edwards. And here is the extraordinary story of Ed Edwards. I think you'll find it profitable. It says, I, Ed Edwards, was once on the FBI's list of the 10 most wanted criminals in America. Now I am a respected citizen in my community. Here's the story of my dramatic turnabout. As a young boy, I felt that the only way I could gain any recognition was to steal. Eventually, I committed armed robberies, impersonated a federal officer, and was sought for questioning about a double murder. I spent time in the federal penitentiaries in Leavenworth and Lewisburg. It was at the latter prison that I started vocational training and very slowly began to realize that I could still be somebody and return to my rightful and legal place in society. There is a tremendous need for communication between parents and their children. I stress this point in my book, which is titled Metamorphosis of a Criminal, signed Ed Edwards. These, these NCIC's records, official records, actually list many of the aliases he used, and it's not even uh, hundreds of the aliases he used. He just was never himself. He was never Ed Edwards. And his wife told me that, his third wife, I have to keep reminding, he was married three times. He was married 56 to 57, 59, 60, 61, 62, and then 69 all the way till his capture. Was he using the lady, same name? She's still alive? All three are still the alive. The last one is Kay. Kay's alive. Marlene's alive in Florida. Is she just, what is she mm. like? I mean, how did she, she do is with completely this completely hypnotized. She's hypnotic almost. It's wow. almost as if she's just not there. Yeah, it's like it's being a victim of abuse yeah. to the point you just go with the flow. But she she would snap once in a while when I would talk to her and then and she would be awake and she would say things and then she'd go back into this kind of hypnotic stare. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the same way that the 1956 wife described the way it was. So, I mean, it was just... The family was always a ruse. The wives weren't even really wives. They were just vehicles for murder. Mm -hmm. wow. Sounds like a movie. confident about this wow. guy, Jimmy Brooks, that I'm wondering. Right. If, if yeah, the yeah, would steer the evidence to what right. the obvious, and if the obvious was and Jamie, then I would bet that there's something more to it because yeah. that's. But it was something going on in this place right Well, see, he had been, Jamie had, had did that too. The, the one, the, the, the little boy that the, uh, described what, what, what happened from the time they walked into the laundromat with Clifford to the time they took him, finished dealing with what they were doing and then bathing. He described everything that happened. He also described everything Clifford had on his body from his top, his, his shirt down to his tennis, color, his green and white tennis shoes. Mm -hmm. He didn't call the color of the different colors in his shirt, what type, type of shirt it was, and knew it was a tennis, uh, a tennis uh, outfit. Mm -hmm. you know? So, you no, know, he, he described everything. What? And everything that he told them that they had done, they had his head, this side right here, it was like, like a, it was, it was so, so dinned into Stamped. like a, yeah. It's called stamp. That's what he would do on the left side of the body because it has to be on the left side. That's the dark side. And that's why that's another piece of the puzzle when I was looking at the Atlanta child killers that fit Edwards. But the biggest piece that fit Edwards was April uh, Edwards, Ed's daughter, 
and his, her timeline is in the book. And she was detailing to me that as kids, 79, 80, they would have been 10, 11 years old, they would make friends with kids here. Mm. And then some that those kids just disappeared. I mean, she says that right in the book. You'll see, right? And, yeah, and right. Dad said they got beaten ahead with a bat. I mean, that's all that. I mean, detailed. She and this would be repeatedly. They would be. They would be. They were made to, to make friends with kids right. so he could kill them. Was 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 the uh, interesting thing um, with this particular situation as far as uh, people like Jamie Brooks? The man who who ran the uh, laundromat that helps me a lot with with what I always knew it had to be, cause I know the streets of Atlanta, right? Um, so a lot of these kids disappear from Thomasville, real real rough part of Atlanta. A lot of them disappeared from uh, Memorial Drive, Decatur, East Lake Meadows area, real rough area. They used to call that Little Vietnam back in the day, you know. Bankhead area, real rough area. So I knew that it had to be people that are other people in the, the, the neighborhoods and those communities would be familiar with. There would have to be a conduit right. for, you know, whoever this or these predators would be, you know, eventually. Because um, what's very interesting, us knowing about what we know about Nathaniel Cater. Nathaniel Cater is the person that they say Wayne threw over the bridge that night and everything else. That's the most important one because right. Edwards had to be at that scene as a police officer that right. night. Well, this, 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 well, see, he didn't die that night. This is the thing. But Nathaniel Cater, right, had, we know that he had assisted in other murders and other situations in Atlanta. We know that he was uh he was gay and that he he was like a sexual deviant in itself. All of this all of that what you're saying right there right. is documented in that book what Ed targeted people like that. Right. He would portray himself as a homosexual. He would have sexual relations with somebody if they he could use that DNA against them or plant it somewhere. Right. Yeah, yeah. it's he was so many, so many right. Ideas. Right. So but what's interesting is, is about where Nathaniel Cater, Pat Man, mm -hmm. and was it Jimmy Ray Payne, the Jimmy other person? Ray. Okay, these were all guys that were known street guys. These were guys that were known criminals, thugs, you know, boxed, new karate, badasses, basically, for lack of a better word. And all three of these guys ended up being basically outside of the parameters of, I don't know if you're familiar with Chet Dellinger's book, The List. No. But uh, basically, Chet Dellinger was a former Atlanta detective, and I think he was like what uh, the assistant public safety commissioner, which is like almost like the assistant to the chief of police in Atlanta. So he really knew, you know, a lot about you know local law enforcement and stuff like that. Well, he came up with a map that basically showed where people were disappearing from and where their bodies where were found. And these three people are the anomaly because they were found up in this area, in the Cobb County area. Mm -hmm. Where everywhere where else... Where the splash from the bridge happened? Is that where they were Well, not too far from right here. Yeah, yeah, but but well, actually, see, the, the whole splash from the bridge thing, that's all... It, that's, fi it, that's fiction. That never but happened. It, but it became the reality right. of the case, right. and the body gets planted below there later to right. be found there. Right, well, it actually got planted on this side. Right. Which, where, where it happened at, right, where that bridge uh -huh. is, you got Atlanta here, Cobb uh -huh. County here, okay. right? And basically the guy gets found like two, two miles north right. of the Cobb County line along the river. So, After you know, for, splash, right? yeah, and for, right. for us right. knowing, for us knowing these guys, uh, these guys had it had to be a somebody who they thought was a police officer, a law enforcement, yeah, or something like that, that to get those three guys. Let you go, yeah. And they were just sounds like killed as part of this bigger scheme of the Atlanta child killings, mm -hmm. and to target Wayne. And and Wayne was the disc jockey, correct? Media yes. disc jockey. Yeah. That's who Edwards targeted his whole life. Editors of the paper, uh, cameramen, 
radio personalities. There's about yeah, ten right pictures right. in the book of him with yeah. the radio stations, his arms around the radio stations. Mm -hmm. That's that's Did he what ever he would mention do. Wayne to you? Did he ever mention? Well, I didn't even know about it then. Didn't know about I, yeah, it. when I when he was alive and I was investigating him, I was investigating the Great Falls murders, yeah. and none of this had come into play until two years ago, awesome. and so. What happened was I just decided that once I realized that he had spent a year in my hometown, 56, killing people and killing people all around the United States, yeah. and no, nobody in law enforcement was going to follow his life after he died because he was an informant for the FBI. There's no way they were going to jump on board and say, hey, he's our boy. And so I did it. Yeah. And uh, the Atlanta child killings just kind of came in with it as the timeline progressed and then the letters I found that he had written. Wow. During him is really what tied him to it. I'm wondering, and I think he did. I'm answering my own question. I think he did study Wayne too. Oh yeah, he would have yeah. definitely known Wayne. Yeah. He would have made sure yeah. he, he would have known who his target was. He always did. Because during the 70s, I would say around right. 71, se no, 72, 73, when Wayne operated Metro News, that's when he got out of the mm -hmm. radio thing, and he would be at different murders that took place, news events at night. Yeah. Yeah. There and I'm thinking go. this guy, yeah, and Wayne was known. He was known by the police for what he was doing. He was known by news crews because yeah. sometimes I would go with him and, you know, be his uh, sound man. Yeah. So I'm like, this guy may have been on the scene. Yeah, you would, well, that's this letter I read, read you earlier. He says, I've been with you every time. That's what he means is that he's standing yeah. right there while yeah. the cops are doing it. And the last one he did in 2008, he was sitting in the hotel lobby while they were you know, processing the scene, and he sent a letter saying the very same thing that he said in the Atlanta child killing letter. The boy lived with some foster parents on the other side of town in Burton. And uh, he was 21 when he graduated from high school, when he went to school with my kids. He got, the, the, the people there got divorced. And so he ended up going with, living with one of the kids that he used to be there and uh, and so anyways, that kid brought him to me one day. He said, I'm going to put him out on the streets in Chardon if you don't want him. He said, because we don't want him. So we took him in and uh, let him live there. And uh, then it was after I started plotting to, down the road to kill him for the insurance purposes and everything that we had his name changed to Danny Boy Edwards and that, but he was not a foster son, he was not an adopted son, he was a, someone that we had taken in. With Danny, I saw an opportunity to, I mean, I was always a schemer, I was always thinking of ways of making money, I've always been into crime. And uh, with Danny, I saw an opportunity here at Long Range, it took about a year to set it up. And that's what I did. I set it up to collect the money and ended up getting $250,000 out of it. And uh, uh, it was arranged, it was premeditated, it was thought out, it was planned. And that's what I did. He went AWOL. I sent him the money. He got the money, he got a Greyhound. He went AWOL and went to Columbus, the bus station in Columbus. That's where I went, and that's where I picked him up at, at the bus station in Columbus. He didn't come here. Then I brought him back to the house, and he stayed at our house unbeknown to my wife. He was out in the barn. He was in the car that was parked there. He was in the house, and uh, it was all set up. I'd already had a, uh, prior to him going into the military, he took out a, a $50,000 insurance policy named as beneficiary. And then while in the military... Did you ask him to do that? Or he did it voluntarily? No, I asked him to, but... Uh, but that was part of your plan then? That was part of my plan, yes. That started back prior to him going into the military. Uh, then the name change was not effective, was not all the way through yet once he went into the military. When he went into the military, he was Danny Glockner. It was while he was in basic training that uh, uh, the name change went through to Danny Boy Edwards. So at that time, he had to go down and change his name on the records to 
uh, the insurance policy because the insurance policy had been made out to the people that he used to live with that had already separated and everything. And matter of fact, one of them was dead. And so he went down and changed his policy over and named my wife and I the beneficiaries. And he, uh, he was going to get a medical discharge uh, from the Army because he, he, he couldn't handle it. But it was about three days prior to that, that's when I talked him into going to Ewok, because he, he, they said he was going to Korea, and he didn't want to go to Korea. So I talked him into going to Ewok, or told him to. He did what I told him. And we went to Columbus. I picked him up in Columbus, brought him back here. And then that was part of the scheme that I put together, and it was, okay, we're going to, I'm re talking to him, as to, we we're going to make a phone call that he burglarized the house and stole money and, and different things like that. And so then when he had it memorized and everything, I took him down to Ledoux and dropped him off, telephone. I went back home and he called me. It was being recorded. Hi, Pops. How are you? And we talked and I'm sorry I burglarized the house and things like that. I said, well, I didn't know you were even in here, Danny. And yeah, and so we went all through that and uh, that he uh, gave the money to another person. And uh, so then uh, it ended, so I went back and picked him up and uh, brought him back to the house. And it was uh, the next night, I think it was the next night, that uh, he ended up losing his life up behind the cemetery because I told him that there was a fellow in Youngstown that was going to come by, pick him up, and hide him out for a couple of months, and then he would be clear. He wouldn't have to worry about anything. He believed all this, and it was up there that he where he died, and I uh, had the body partially covered and kept it that way. I went back up there about every three or four months to check, because I wanted the body found, but not immediately, but I didn't want to bury it either. So I left it partially covered. and. Uh, the one time it was about a year later when I went up to check on it, the head had been separated from the body through the animals and everything. And uh, I took it with me and took it across the street and threw it up into the field. And the police and everything, they've been looking for it, but they can't find it. It was nothing but the skull. They've been unable to, unable to find it. But uh, uh, it was a hundred that. Uh, found Danny and, uh, and the rest of the story, everybody knows it, uh, where he was found and, and why, but that was set up. And after he was found, it was, oh, I'm not sure, maybe a year later, maybe, maybe not as much as a year, that I collected uh, $250,000 on the from the, uh, the investigation, but uh, the attorney, I had an attorney representing me, and he got a third of this, so the rest of it we got. And my wife, she was not aware of any of this. I endorsed all the paperwork and forged her name, and, and uh, she knew absolutely nothing. She is a very Christian-like woman. Where did the additional, you said it was original, it was a $50,000 policy. Where did the other 200000 did he take out an additional policy? No, when you go in the military, mm -hmm. you can have different amounts. Of, they, they give you, and you, it comes out of your pay pay, and he was covered with $200,000 military.